noticed we have some people who've come to us over time and place, and I would like to now introduce Thaddeus and Leontine, and they will tell us more about themselves. So much to talk. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. And talk about dedicated. I mean, to be here, I know this isn't your hottest June ever, and we're very, very great, grateful that this is a cooler, cooler day. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for coming out for our presentation today and uh, leaving the comfort of that air conditioner in your home. But anyway, we're, we promise you to give you lots and lots of brain food. Now, can anybody tell me in the back, can you hear me okay? Yes. Super. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, one thing I did want to say that um, uh, Rebecca wanted me to bring up is that one thing that you are um, new to uh, find out tonight. Anyway, this is our last California presentation. And it's after 15 years. I wonder what took us so long to get here, though. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, after 15 years of this, we were just at the drum barracks and all that, and they just gave us a big goodbye party this last weekend. Mm. But um, the main thing is we're moving to Kentucky. So oh, we get to wow. go out to hollow ground, oh. and our house just closed today. Oh, so, wow. I, I mean, over there. <laughs> now we got to sell this one. But So we'll still be here for about another six, seven weeks. But, um, but unfortunately, this is our last schedule presentation. Our last hurrah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a long, long journey, and um, one of the main reasons we started this was in 2003, if anybody know the name Poncho Barnes, or the legend of Poncho Barnes, the film on PBS, there you go. Well, that's how we started doing this, there you go. And um, I was working with the producers and the director in that, because I lived with Poncho back in the 60s. Yes, I am 71, believe it or not. <laughs> but I just turned 18, and I was her secretary and traveled with her. And oh, wow. There's a story to tell. I just told that one out at the Chino Plains of Fames in February. So luckily we got a PowerPoint going on that one, too. But the one little piece of information a lot of people don't realize is that the grandparents of Pancho Barn is that is and Leah T. Lowe. So um, one of the things her family was very beautiful, very, very rich people, and she was definitely go born with a gold spoon in her mouth, but um, she just got the worst of everything. And as a teenager, she said, I have a choice. I can be miserable because I don't look like the other girls and things like that, and, or else I can choose happy. She chose happy, and we're grateful for the history that she provided with everybody from Howard Hughes to Chuck Yeager to Buzz Aldrin to you name it. So Amelia, her too. So there's a lot of history behind her, and in this process of starting um, what we do, the Lowe's, was to be able to bring out the information about the film and to bring back a lot of the Civil, uh, Civil War history regarding the place that the Lowe's and the inventions, 200 patents plus, and you'll see a number of those tonight. And one of the parts we don't have in our program, so in this case, we're just now talking about this today, that is even invented the first air conditioner for the White House. <laughs> so that's what we're thinking about air right now. And when you see, uh, we saw the Wells Fargo Bank Museum over here, but unfortunately it was closed today. Um, but Thaddeus is the one who actually created what Wells Fargo was, Citizen National Bank in the beginning. And then as years went on, it finally got sold down the line to where it kind of blended back into, into Wells Fargo. But if you look at all the other museums in Los Angeles, <coughs> Wells Fargo and San Diego and all that, all his pictures are there for starting the Citizen National Bank. So that one's not included on this program. So I wanted to at least squeeze that in before I forget. <laughs> Schools in. Thank, good job. I hope I don't offend you. I'm going to get undressed because of the excellent weather, so I'm going to be a bit underdressed now. <laughs> Thank you. But this is kind of like familiar territory for me. Um, man first flew in 1783. What's that? Oh, lights. Oh, there you go. Man first flew in 1783. The Montgolfier brothers built a hot air balloon. They called it a smoke balloon. They didn't understand it was the hot air, not the smoke itself, that made the balloon go up in the air. Wow. And uh, the first victims, or I should say passengers, were a goose, a chicken, and a, and a, and a, um, a duck. And they survived. Oh. And so man, for a week later, was flying. So uh, the first flight was in 1783 in Paris. And um, 
then 17, in that, an audience of that uh, flight was um, Th uh, Thomas Jefferson, the ambassador to, excuse me, Benjamin Franklin, the ambassador to, to Paris, France. And seeing such a flight, a skeptical observer said, well, what good is that? And Ben Franklin thinking, well, what good is a newborn baby? He saw the potential of technology. <laughs> so he arranged for a gentleman named Pierre Blanchard to come to the United States. 1793 was the first flight in America. Unfortunately, Mr. Franklin had passed away by then. But in, in the audience of that flight was most of the signers of the, of the uh, Declaration of Independence. So it's a very, very important moment in, in technological history in America. If you roll your chronometers forward a few years, in 1832, I was born in Randolph uh, Mills, New Hampshire. I'm Professor Thaddeus Sobieski Constantine Lowe. All you genealogists must think, that's a name full of heritage. Well, it turns out my mother was reading a book by Jane Porter called Thaddeus of Warsaw, and those are characters in that book. <laughs> so not, not so distinguished as it sounds. And as a young man, I was born of a farm, farming family in Jefferson Hills, New Hampshire, and this is below the White Mountains, so I was very fascinated by the cloud formations, all the weather patterns we could see flying over the, uh, or going over the mountains there. Well, when my uh, mother passed away when I was 10 years old, I, I left the, the, the family to go to where my brother was in, in um, Boston to be a cobbler. He was at making shoes. And here's the genealogy of, um, here I am right here, Thaddeus Slow in Boston. The, the specialty of this shoe shop was what's called the Congress Gator. It's a very popular shoe at the time. And as a young man, I was able to develop a way to wet the blades with a special oil to cut the, uh, um, the leather much more finely, much more, more uh, accurately. And as a very young man, that was my, my first um, invention I ever had. By and 18 so years old. In this town, as I was do, doing this job, a gentleman came to town named Professor, Professor Reginald Dinkelhoff. And he was running a traveling science show. Science to most people back then was like magic. And he needed a volunteer to come on stage with him to volunteer and help him with, with the show. And I was very enthusiastic about it. I did a great job helping him out. So he invited me to come up and down the eastern seaboard to, uh, to run the show with him. And shortly thereafter, he retired. I was able to buy the, the goods for the show and the rights to the show, and I became a professor. Mm -hmm. That is so this And mm -hmm. professor didn't mean a whole lot back then. It was, there was no education. I had a fourth grade education. Turns out I was all self-taught. And I learned from Professor Dinkelhoff about all the science and stuff that he knew. And it was a title given to people by the press. If you had anything to do with science, you're a professor. That was the, uh, the moniker that, that you received. It didn't have any education behind that, as it does today. And I was doing a traveling science show in New York City. And in the audience of this show was this ravishing young Leontine Augustine Gachon, straight from France. And our eyes met. A bit too long, perhaps. A little bit about, about Leontine here. She was born in Paris, France. Her father was the chief of the palace guard of King Louis Philippe. So she had a world class education. She was educated with the king's children. So she had a fourth grade. She was like the best there is in the world. Until I was 14. And she lived in the Tuileries Palace. With her, with her family. And uh, in 1849, actually 1848, I should say, there was a second revolution in France, and the king was deposed, and uh, her father and, and brought the king and his family and their entourage to, to London, England. And in 1849, they uh, jumped on the ship, the America, and they came to the United States to become Americans. And unfortunately, uh, the father, uh, Gaston, went back and was killed uh, during the revolution. And um, so Leontina and Mother Louise were left here alone. And we met at the, at the parlor there. One week after we met... February 14th, 1855. Now, this is the day we met in New York City. And um, we're kind of changing that story a little bit. Um, all the family, all the history books throughout there, all the family says they were born in, or married in New York City where they met in that same hotel. It turns out, we doing genealogy, um, Leontine, or Patrice, found they were married in Cuyahoga County in Cleveland, Ohio, of all places. Oh. We changed history. May I go? We did go from New York to, uh, with my mother, we had a chaperone with us, to Cleveland, and then we hopped the ship, the palace, that was going down from Zanesville, uh, down to St. Zanesville, mm -hmm. down to um, New Orleans, and we were working on this entertainment barge. I was doing marionette shows, he was doing his science shows, and that was kind of the beginning of our time together. And then, shortly a year later, we have our first daughter, Louise. Yes. 1836. And there's our wedding photos. The tradition of the day was you did not get a photograph wow. with your spouse. And for example, you see the Lincolns. They, there's no picture of them married together in a picture together, together like that. And so as a young man, I said I was, uh, was living at, uh, below the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And I wanted to start a weather bureau that the mariners and the farmers could do their, their jobs much more efficiently and safely 
So what better way to study the weather than to build a balloon and fly up into the weather? And uh, balloon was, balloon was very popular today. It was a very uh, popular sideshow, mostly in circuses. As you see, when a balloon shows up in, in the city, thousands of people, mm -hmm. the whole entire population of the city would show up. They would pay a balloonist to inflate a balloon in a city, much less fly. And a lot, the, the graduation money goes up if you fly, you take people for flights and so on. So you, you wouldn't think so. It was a very lucrative uh, occupation at the time. And so I became an expert balloon manufacturer. I made balloons for circuses and such. And my workhorse was the Enterprise, my scientific balloon. The first balloon, the Pioneer, was sewed by Leontine very accomplished seamstress from the King's Palace. <laughs> and uh, as part of this um, idea, they had uh, built the Atlantic Cable, and the cable went underneath the ocean to communicate to Europe. And shortly after it was, it was first turned on, it failed. And the idea with this large blue was to fly the, across the Atlantic Ocean. It would take normally two weeks for a ship to go across the ocean. You know, I uh, figured with uh, my calculations and my observ observations of wind currents, really high what they call the jet stream today, uh, I could get across in 64 hours. So I built this world's largest balloon at the time. The, the standard hot air balloon today is about 80,000 cubic feet. This was 750,000 cubic feet. And it, the, the uh, balloon itself weighed two tons. The entire craft was 10 tons, but the lifting capacity of the gas was 22 tons. So we carry you know, much more than we, we, than we uh, lift. With. And there's the gas um, meter in New York City. The problem was in, in, it's called the city of New York in celebration of flying from New York. Well, the city could not provide gas fast enough to keep it inflated so we can get up and, and fly. because it, you know, it made of linen, so it wasn't really airtight. So as fast as the gas would leak, would leak out, they, they couldn't supply it fast enough. I had a friend named uh, Mr. Elliot Crescent, who was the head of uh, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. He was also the chairman of the board for the Point Breeze Gas Works. He promised he could get me the gas I needed to get to, to fly the balloon across the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. And here's the boat, the Leontine, to be hung below the, the city of New York. That's an aluminum boat. And we had worldwide coverage. It was a very uh, well-known endeavor, very expensive, very... Uh, People laughed at me. They said I could never, could never do it. It's not possible. And I, I could prove them otherwise. If I did prove them otherwise, I'd, I'll get back to that. Sorry. <laughs> kind of like the flying goose. Anyway, you did it though. <laughs> when, the, uh, when the balloon was, um, when I went, went to Philadelphia, the famous publisher Horace Greeley knew that the largest boat in the world, the Great Eastern, was coming to Philadelphia. So he said, any publicity is good publicity. Rename your balloon. So I took his advice. It's now the Great Western. And this is a subscription note. It was a very costly endeavor. So I was selling uh, its subscriptions to anybody who wanted to invest in this. this uh, proposition. I was. We made it very. Um, here's the balloon being uh, inflated in Philadelphia, and a little bit larger there. And that's myself right here. And uh, we did very, a very successful test flight. We flew with six people on board. It meant to carry ten. In fact, there was a, a Philadelphia newspaper writer was on there. There's a great article about his experience. They called him the Monarch of the Air, and he said what what great how, how delicately I was able to handle this monster to you know, <laughs> land it very carefully. And we went from Philadelphia to the Jersey Shore. And once uh, we landed very, very uh, calmly or very uh, softly, everybody survived, no problem at all. We're ready for the next flight. So we had to deflate it, pack it up, take it back to Philadelphia. In the transport, it was damaged. Oh. And we went to inflate it for the final flight, and the seams ripped out. Oh, cool. And the plans don't go away. This next season, we're going to fly. So we're going to, and, and things unfortunately intervened in, in the meantime. So my a good friend, Professor Joseph Henry, the first director of the Smithsonian, suggested instead of flying this long distance flight across the Atlantic for your first long distance flight, why don't you take your balloon west? And fly from the, from the west to the east and prove your high altitude uh, airflow theory. So I took his advice. I went to Cincinnati, Ohio, with my trusty Enterprise, my scientific balloon. And here it's being inflated. And at 2 a.m. on um, April 19th, notice the date, two days prior to Fort Sumter flying the Confederates, I took off from, from, um, from Cincinnati. And so my balloon flight was from Cincinnati to where I could see the ocean in Virginia. I wasn't ready to cross the ocean. So I, I uh, um, vented some gas out. And I was able to fly down and skirt the uh, rice paddies and land in Unionville, South Carolina. During this flight over the Allegheny Mountains, I went as high as 18,000 feet. I had a special wow. altimeter that I designed, and that showed how high I was up there. I learned a very important thing about atmosphere and an ice and such that I'll will tell you about later. And so um, when I get to Virginia, I had to find out where I am. So I vent some gas down, see some farmers in the field down below, and I yelled out, where am I? <laughs> They had no idea to look up. Unless you lived in a city, you, you would never have seen a balloon because the balloons were in circuses. But you have never seen you know, anything in the air larger than a bird. So, so I dropped a ballast bag to get their attention. They looked up, Virginia! And they scrambled. They were scared to death. This monstrosity. You know, he's a devil. I, I'm in my top hat and tails like this. And, and you know, what did they think I could be? I'm a devil. Or, but it turns out, when I landed in Unionville, South Carolina, I'm from New Hampshire. I don't fit in with South Carolinians too well. So what am I? I'm a Yankee spy, of course. What else could I be? 
So I became what, what is considered the first prisoner of the Civil War, oh. and as, a, as captured as a spy. And they put me under lock and key. Luckily, I had done previous uh, balloon testing work in South Carolina the previous summer. So a few negotiations and some gentleman, for, for the president of the university there, was able to come and vouch me. He's a scientist. He's not a spy. I let him go. And so they put me on a train with my balloon, very important. And they, I took, went from uh, Columbia, South Carolina, to Cincinnati. I flew that nine hours, five days to get back. Wow. Long railroad trip. Wow. So when I, I got to Cincinnati, uh, of course, the, uh, the war had started now. And... Um, I decided that the science of aeronautics and myself could somehow volunteer my services to the Union Army to help you know, preserve the Union. So I took my bullet to Washington, D.C. Notice here is the Capitol building, not quite finished yet. This is what it would have looked like from a balloon. And I, I took my, um, the other aeronauts were in, in town as well because they're very patriotic. They wanted to do something as well to help the Union cause. And I had a secret weapon with me, though. With my balloon, I had a small, hair thin piece of wire and a green, uh, wrapped in green silk. It's a telegraph wire. So I hooked my, my balloon to the White House, to the telegraph office, as well as the War Department. So I, I sent this message down to the White House. The first person ever to receive an electronic message from the air to the ground was President Abraham Lincoln himself. And that technology is so impressive. I, I didn't invent telegraph or the balloon, but the marriage of the two technologies was revolutionary. And that's so impressive that he hired me as the chief of the balloon corps, oh. with a few caveats along the way, as you'll see. Um, Here's the telegraph. I won't read it all. It basically says, thank you so much for allowing me to do this demonstration. And what a great view I had from 500 feet in the air above it. And where it was flown was where the, uh, the Air and Space Museum is now in the mall in Washington. That's where that flight took place. And so President Lincoln, I went to see a General Scott, the head general at the time. And he was not interested at all. He was an old line general, was not, did not care for new technology as, as most I mean, the old generals did not. They didn't know how to understand it or use it. So he gave me this note, will Lieutenant General Scott please see Professor Lowe once again about his balloon? I took the note to the general, he's having lunch, okay, I'll come back. He's taking a nap, fine, okay. He's too busy to see you, I'm getting frustrated, so I go to Washington, I go back to the White House and say, President Lincoln, so the general will not see me. And he said, well, we'll go find what the matter is. He grabbed a stovepipe hat, walked down with me, stormed to the general's office and said, this is my friend Professor Lowe, he has started a balloon corps for the Union Army, you will do everything in your power to make sure he succeeds. That's paraphrased. And, um, and the orders went out, and the Balloon Corps became an official part of the Army of the Potomac. Wow. Aeronautical Department of the Army of the Potomac. It's a mouthful of words. <laughs> and here's our favorite general, General Scott. He's, um, President Lincoln is 6'4", a very large man for the time. General Scott's 6'5", and 300 plus pounds. Very imposing gentleman. If he says no, you believe him. Mr. Fuss and Feathers. Yes, indeed. <laughs> A great war um, hero in the Mexican-American War, but he was at the end of his, his tenure as a general in the U.S. Army at this point. And Leontine will tell you about the aerostats, or the balloons. The fabric, the fabric. <laughs> what, what, what can I say? Um, when we were doing the balloon manufacturing, though, we had to then reinvent these balloons to be war balloons, in the sense that we wanted them to be as secure as he could for, for Thaddeus to be up there. And they had different purposes, as you'll see. Um, these were double bag gas bags, triple seamed um, uh, on the seams and that. Uh, Thaddeus also, in this process, invented a special varnish that then he would put four coats of this varnish on there so that it would actually, actually go from the elevation of the cold, come back to the warm, and still be pliable enough. Inside, we would put feet soil. That would also give it some more pliability in that. But it also, the, one of the problems was that people were trying to use cotton. Cotton was so porous that all, any gas that you put in it was out in a matter of hours. So that's why he was adding so many coats of varnish in order to keep the, uh, at first he was using gas, but then you'll find out it goes to hydrogen gas. So this is Thaddeus' father, uh, Clovis Lowe, and you'll see, aren't the ladies there sewing our balloons look like nurses of the day? <laughs> um, but actually we had 50 seamstresses, and we had 17 of the Wilson Wheeler sewing machines at the time. And as you see back nowadays, of course, sewing goes front to back. It was side to side. It was a very good invention for making such things as our gas bags. Very long scenes, very, very efficient of these kind of sewing machines. So then, so as you can see, our balloons had many different uses, though. Our very largest ones, though, the very first one we made those called the Union. This could took 39 yards, uh, 39 bolts of fabric to make these. We used Ponji silk is what we're doing. And part of this uh, varnish he was using was Japan driver dryer 
benzene and linseed oil. And it had to come up to a very high temperature in order to make it last a long time on these gas bags. So uh, the Intrepid is one of the most famous because Matthew Brady was always photographing it. But these uh, larger balloons took longer to fill. It took, um, but we used these because we could put telegraph operators in and map makers in here. And there was a, we could always go at least five or six men. And because map making at the time was always on the ground. Now he can actually tell you where everything is. But he also needed people that knew that was Mason's farm. This was this and this. So that's when the maps were getting changed. The middle range ones, they, they, they're more um, global. And, um, but as you can see, they had different purposes and how many. Some just got up so fast because we needed uh, information right now. And of course, traveling with the Army. This was an interesting uh, moment in our time on the chain bridge. On the chain bridge, uh, there's a big traffic jam on the chain bridge outside of Washington going over to um, Alexandria, Virginia. And um, they have these 18 inch wide girders on, this, um, on the bridge. And the men were transporting my balloon by holding the ropes. I'm in the basket and holding the ropes. And they would, had to scale on the girders, 100 feet over the water, balancing over you know, as they're walking. And we were very successful getting it across. Very oh. dangerous for the men, though. So we had to find some way more efficiently to travel with the Army. Another problem with the balloon is a fair weather machine. So it's very hard to inflate the balloon and transport it already inflated. So we had to find a way to, to take the balloon before the Army went. And this is the way we did it. Mrs. On to his next invention. As he just said, you cannot, as everyone that has been back east know, it's well to wall force, pretty much. So <laughs> then he had to now invent, how can we not drain the city of their coal gas, try to get it back out to the battlefield in a timely manner? So he goes on and he gets a, a, a military chassis wagon there, and the box on top is 11 feet long by 5 feet high. Anyway, inside, the, and we wrap it with copper. This was a beast. Uh, inside, though, we had shelves, and from all the iron filings at the Navy shipyard, uh, then he would actually put all the iron filings on it, fill it with water, and on the very, very top, we would pour in sulfuric acid. The beast would get to work. Noisy, smelly, just foul, needless to say, very loud, and everybody didn't like getting near this thing, but it worked. So he, we had 12 of these. It took two of them to fill the Intrepid in about three hours. And um, go back one more time. Go back. One more time back. So the process, what I wanted to show you how this gas, hydrogen gas, could be made. A new company was just invented. Goodyear. Goodyear Rubber Company. That's right. Just invented. So now we've been able to get the tubing that can take on the causticness of this gas as it comes out. A lot of copper tubing to try to cool it down. And the first box there on the left, this would just be water, getting out the first impurities, trying to continue to cool this gas. More piping, more rubber, uh, rubber hosing. And then the last one was filled with lime and water, once again, to get more impurities out and cool it down before it would go into the gas bag, because this fabric would just completely melt if it went in straight from the wagon. It took 3,200 pounds of iron filings and 1,600 pounds of sulfuric acid to fill one balloon using two generators. The acid came in these large five-gallon glass carboys, like a, like a sparkless ball example. So the supplies, though, that were needed to get all this out in the field, though, that was another whole ballpark. I could go through pages of the kind of supplies they needed. It was said, though, that three of the wagons that during one of the battles was left out there for the Confederates. But we assure you that if you knew the kind of uh, materials, even our... Um, the master supply sergeant now couldn't even figure out what we need, goodness sakes, even a broom for. But the point being is, all these supplies we had them, we are really sure that they couldn't use it for any more than firewood. All custom made <laughs> valves and, and so on for the, the balloon core, for the generators. And there's a close up. Notice once again the, the capital building is not quite uh, finished yet, the dome is still being constructed. And here's the balloon, uh, the um, generators being in, in action in the field. The two generators, you can see now they're full of gas and it's being filtered and put, taken over to the balloon here. This was on the Peninsula Campaign in 1862 outside of Richmond, Richmond Virginia. And we got another invention going on. So now when you think of this, we still have trees, mud, 
I mean, a lot of things that we have to get through. Thaddeus then says, wait a minute, why don't we just go up and down the river? It's a lot easier to transport ourselves. Once again, he goes to Gideon Wells, $150. He buys a 122-foot coal barge, cuts off the top, puts wood planks on, on the top of this coal barge, and now he can put on all our supplies, horses, our generators. We can then do, what is an aircraft carrier? Flight deck operations, right? <laughs> so that's why it's known as the first aircraft carrier. The family for the Confederates in the room here, just let you know, they like to claim it as their first aircraft carrier to talk about, but all their, the balloon that they tried to uh, pull down the river was only being pulled. No flight deck operations whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So that's why we get to claim it. But we did have the Curleon Dillon. This uh, balloon here is a representation of General Sickles. The tug was a Cour de Leon, was the name of the tug. I mean, so General Sickles later of, um, of Gettysburg fame is in the balloon. This is the balloon Washington being towed down the Potomac River. And there's the Cordillon. And we also invented the first aerial spotlight. We used a, 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 what's called a calcium light. It's a small marble-sized compressed piece of, piece of calcium. We shoot an acetylene flame on it. Remember, hydrogen's right up there. Very, very important that you keep control of that flame. And that, one of my that, silver platters. And that, yeah, the little uh, piece of calcium would glow very brightly, and we use a mirror silver platter, and we could aim the beam where we wanted to go. It wasn't really bright enough to see much from the air, but we could illuminate the ground so the uh, the uh, bridge builders could build bridges and the troops could ford rivers more readily. It was experimental, it was used a little bit, it was very successful, but it just wasn't used widespread during the war, during the Balloon Corps' time. And the main mission of the Balloon Corps was uh, reconnaissance, basically to observe and report what the Confederate Army is doing, where they are, what, where they're going, how many of them there are. For example, you can see um, the little humps on the hill. Those are tents. We could count tents and estimate troop, estimate troop strengths. At night, we could count campfires and do the very same thing. We could observe the, the uh, trains and very wagon trains and such. In the distance, uh, on a good day, I could see for 15, 20 miles with my uh, high-power binoculars. In the distance, you could watch a dust cloud. The way it's, it's propagating, it could be troops marching slowly. If it propagates faster, it could be cavalry advancing, different ways, the, um, cooking smoke, and uh, burning trash smoke and musket and can of smoke are all different. They look different. So you can tell these things from a long ways away what's happening in the distance and give this tactical or more strategic, strategic information to our command staff. Notice uh, the, uh, the ropes on the balloon. All our flights were, were tethered to the ground. We had it for two reasons. The uh, main reason was we could run a telegraph wire down those ropes and give uh, the ground real-time information about what we're seeing. If the uh, telegraph wasn't available in the area, we could use what's called a paper express. We would put a brass ring on the ropes and tie a, 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 a note to it and it'll wait with the bullet and then slide it down the rope to the command, st uh, command staff. Mm, we also yeah. use signal flies as well mm. sometimes. And one of the tricks that General Magruder always did, though, he always had the forest in his favor, of course, but he would take how many men run into the forest, make them run out, and they would think on the ground, this is a whole new set of troops. But Thaddeus knew up there, they were just running in and running out. And it's like his troops in a circle make us think there's a lot more than there really was. And it was effective until Thaddeus comes up there. And then they always report to, of course, Pinkerton, uh, being in control of McClellan, would say there's 180,000 troops down there. No, I'm trying to tell you, there's only 100,000. But um, even General Beauregard called the first blackout because of the, uh, Thaddeus Lowe being up there, which made, of course, the South very, very uncomfortable. They could no longer burn their fires, lighting, make themselves comfortable for the evening because Thaddeus was out there counting the tents mm -hmm. and, and also, moving them out. Map making was, was uh, revolutionary because all, most of the maps were made from um, ground observations for being. Um, you know, on the ground, they'd make measurements and such. I can't think of the word all of a sudden. But from the balloon, you could see where the roads are, where they're going. Get a local uh, man up there that knows the area. And this is the Gaines Farm. This is so-and-so's mill over here. And make very, very accurate maps. And uh, one of the main axioms in military operations is to find and, and, and conquer the high ground. In balloon corps, we should make our own high ground. And another one of the things we started was artillery, aerial artillery spotting for the very first time. It's where that um, there's a target in the distance that the uh, cannoneers could not see. And they could take a shot at it, and using the telegraph, I could correct their aim very, very quickly. And we get a, a common question is, is the balloon a good thing to drop bombs from or to shoot from? Well, the weight we can carry, not really. And it's, it's always moving a little bit, so you can't shoot from up there. But with my telegraph, I could command a battery of artillery. So I could command 10, 20, however many cans they had out there to zero in on a specific target they could not even see. So it was very revolutionary for the day. And here's, um, they call me the most shot at man in the Civil War. 
Thank goodness the most missed. Not only was all the union shooting at him, because they didn't know if he really wasn't from the South. Maybe the South had already invented their uh, balloon corps. But uh, the next prop, so that is then started putting on everything from McClellan and Eagles and Washington and red, white, and blue. So he said, wait a minute, I'm one of you. But the worst problem was, of course, the Confederates were shooting at him, but the worst problem was every farmer was shooting at him. You know, because they did not want these on this farm. This is the first UFO. Get it out of here. Yes, I'm the bullseye in the sky. I'm not stealth. If I can see you, you can see me. Therefore, you're shooting at me. Um, the Balloon Corps, we had another uh, seven aeronauts besides myself. I was the chief, and I, uh, the other people that flew with us were balloonists prior to the war, but there are certain techniques for flying uh, tethered balloons in, in weather and such. And so between um, all eight of, eight of us, we had 6,000 flights, 3,000 personally, and they never shot us down. That, that shows you that it was effective, our, our techniques. And one of the reasons we didn't get shot down, kind of one of those unknown little things, yes, we had a lot, we had a steel plate in the bottom of our car, or our basket, and these baskets though were only three feet high and about three foot square all around. They were not big baskets. And so, consequently, we had a lot of pinging going on from everybody trying to shoot at us. But the worst problem was that the, um, um, we, yes, we had lots and lots of little holes in our gas bags we had to repair. Didn't bring them down, but just at that about time, uh, the Gatling gun was invented. Oh, no. So you could take a Gatling gun at our gas bag, though, and it still wouldn't bring us down because oh. of the fact that the bullets, the Monet bullet and that, were all cold bullets. You need a spark to bring down our hydrogen gas balloon, right? Mm -hmm. So what we were frightened of was pipes and cigars. <laughs> so we always had to have sentry around us and picket lines in order to keep, because there was awards out from the South saying, if you can bring down one of his gas bags, you're going to be made a general. Exactly. A thousand dollar bounty for, for stopping us. Mm -hmm. um, this anti-aircraft gun, before we were up, there was no reason to shoot that high in the sky. So they would try, for example, to put a hole behind the tail of the cannon and fire up, and they had all sorts of difficulties. But to do that, you can't aim back and forth. Let's see how big the balloon is, how far away is it? So it was very difficult for them to shoot us down, and obviously because it never worked. The 500-foot danger zone, anything above 500 feet, we were, were free and clear from anybody who could shoot us because the artillery couldn't angle in high enough. So uh, when, we, when we launched from behind the tall timbers, they it kind of surprised them and were up by the time they'd get prepared to shoot at us. Above 500 feet, we were impervious. At 500 feet, you have this lovely rope line. The balloon's coming down this way, so you can aim at the, at the rope line. So what we did is we had all the balloons were, were tethered with, with, um, pulleys. with pulleys on the ground. We had 10 men per rope. We always had at least three ropes on the balloons. And when I give them the signal at 500 feet, they'd all run different directions and, and bring the balloon down very, very quickly. Yeah. Then Pretty they had fast. to readjust all their cal calculations to try to figure out how they could aim at them again. And, uh, the main battles we were part of was the Peninsula Campaign in 1862. The idea was um, they're going to take the, uh, from, from Washington, take the army down over the Potomac River in the back door of, of Richmond here on the peninsula. And um, Joe McClellan had a problem, though. It's called the Slows. There was uh, President Lincoln once told, it, once told him, to paraphrase, if you're not going to use your army, can I borrow it for a while? <laughs> and one of the main reasons was he was a fantastic organizer. He, had a, he trained a great army, but he just wouldn't, would not fight it. And one reason is because he always thought there was more people against him than there really was. And the reason was because of this gentleman, Alan Pinkerton. He, him, him and his men would go out and be the spies for McClellan. They'd be, count regimental banners and make troop estimates that way. And that's a very poor way to, to estimate troop strengths. From my balloon hunt, I could actually estimate based on the campfires and, the, and what I saw in you know, real time, there was much fewer people than McClellan thought there was. So he had difficulty. You know, he didn't want to fight his, his army. So we got outside of Richmond, Virginia, with the balloon corps, within eight miles of the capital of, of um, the Confederacy. And here's my trustee Steve there. We found a colorized version of the same picture. And the Battle of Fair Oaks was the primary battle. And um, th to make it short, um, there's the Confederate troops were, were massing here to attack the Union here. I was able to observe this from Mechanicsville, and I had my larger balloon, the Intrepid. And... Um, so I had to take my, my horse down to no, down to Fair Oaks, and um, this balloon is only partly, this is our, our telegraph balloon, the Intrepid, is only partly inflated, so these lines in this balloon are men pressing gas out of that balloon in to get to the bigger balloon. We had a, made a camp, um, uh, camp um, think about it, a pot. They cut the bottom up, and they made a collar to attach the two balloons together. 
And here's the Intrepid up in the air. And it was said that I kept the uh, telegraph wires hot with information during this battle. I was able to give them actual real time. They're moving here, they're moving there. This is what's happening in real time. And I got letters later from generals saying, you know, thanking me that I saved the Army of the Potomac from in this battle. On uh, a different front of the same battle called the Battle of Seven Pines, you see the balloon here in the different distance, I was flying about 1,000 feet, and I could see these gentlemen, this group of people meeting behind the tall timber. I could tell they're on horseback, there was officers, there were civilians. I didn't know who they were at the time, so I decided to take an artillery battery and, and to take some shots in, in there. We killed a couple of horses, injured some men. We found out in this group of men, there was General General Longstreet, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, and before he became the legend that he, that he is, General Robert E. Lee was in that group. What if we had a couple of well-placed shots, maybe the, uh, we could decapitate the Confederacy in 1862 instead of the war going on for three more years. I love that what if. The arm of the Confederacy, yes, the Confederates did have um, a balloon. Do you want to talk at all about that? Yeah. Uh, they call it the Silk Dress Balloon. It was designed and built by um, Charles Seaver and com commanded by Langdon Chevis. It was called the Silk Dress Balloon because the myth was that the latest Confederacy donated their ball gowns to make this this balloon. In fact, it was a dress material, so it was this big Christmas ornament in the sky. In a note, I, I call it the Joseph Coat of Many Colors. Thanks and, for General Longstreet. And uh, in June of 1862, I was actually facing off with their balloon in the distance. The first time opposing air forces faced themselves and you know, faced each other in the air. But the gazelle really only flew twice, June 26, 1862, and uh, we captured it on the sandbar from the Maritanza um, in um, July 4th, and w they gave it to Thaddeus Lowe, and he cut it up in many pieces, gave it to the congressmen, and um, we found out in, the, in 1930, if you go to the Confederate Museum in Richmond, that our son actually do donated a piece of the silk gel balloon uh, in 1930 and gave the other piece to uh, Library of Congress. And there it is in the light box, all those glorious colors. The gentleman you saw earlier, um, Edward Porter Alexander, he was the, um, the pilot in the Gazelle, and he later became one of General Lee's top generals in the artillery in the Battle of Gettysburg, for example. But even Custer was in there. He did not like flying. They wanted to have We will up. show them, Custer. Oh, can I go Take ahead? your turn. Yes, sir. <laughs> She's so enthusiastic. <laughs> this is Campbell in Virginia. This is um, the Balloon Corps staff. We couldn't uh, fly without them. We have, for example, um, my father, Clovis Lope. There, long button, was uh, is right here. He's our, one of our operations managers, and various uh, pilots that we had. We're trying. We have a little bit of time to get through the, the rest of the presentation here. Um, for you genealogists, here is some of the uh, groups that actually um, worked with the balloon corps. Every time the balloon corps had to move, they had we had to recruit a whole set, a new set of soldiers to to man it and to, to be the, the rope bearers and everything. And we are, the balloon corps itself is very very small in numbers of men. And uh, here's some generals that flew with us. You see some of the names, McClellan, Hooker, Sickles, uh, very uh, famous generals. And here's, we had some unusual people as well, is the staff. And this, this gentleman here, you might recognize, is Lieutenant George Custer. He flew with it at the siege of Yorktown. And when the balloon went up, he was scared to death of flying in the balloon. He was seen in the basket <laughs> doing this. He was scared to death. He, he, he joked about his memoirs, though, saying that he, when he came down, he was heard to say, General Porter, I will do anything you ask of me, but don't set me up with that damned infernal balloon again. He liked his ponies better. <laughs> Another gentleman that flew with us was a, a young cavalry officer from Germany. You might recognize the name, Count Vernon von Zeppelin. He uh, took it a little farther after, after the war. He, he learned from us and, and took it many steps further than we had. And after the Peninsula Campaign, I contracted malaria very, very severely, and I was out of action for a while. Um, to make it quick, the Balloon Corps stopped in the Battle of Chancellorsville in 1863. I flew that um, battle for free for the Army because I quit. Um, I, General, uh, Captain Comstock, under General Hooker, became head of the Balloon Corps. I'm a civilian during the entire time, so I have no authority whatsoever. Everything I need and everything that we, as a Balloon Corps, I have to talk to the, all the military. And I had ways around them, and they hated that. So that was perhaps one reason why they cut my pay in half, and they made things very, very difficult bureaucratically for me. So the Balloon Corps uh, died of bureaucratic strangulation in 1863. Yeah. And unfortunately, there was no other, nobody else with the enthusiasm for the project, than even the other balloonists. It went on for a few more months, but it didn't really do anything after that at all. So uh, the, Confederate, the, the, general who, the general who was the pilot of the Confederate balloon said this, I have never understood why the enemy, being us, abandoned the use of military balloons in 1863 after having used them extensively up to that time. Even if the observers never saw anything, 
they would have been worth all they cost for the annoyance and delays they caused us in trying to keep our movements out of their sight. And our generals didn't get that, that, didn't get that idea, is unfortunately. So, after the war, um, I still flew blue balloons. I built a balloon amphitheater in New York City on Central Park, and we had to see uh, unusual shaped balloons. We had trapeze artists flying below the balloons doing tricks and such. It was still a very lucrative way uh, to make a, business, uh, a living. There's a balloon um, ticket and um, to make an ascension. As people would pay a lot of money to fly in a balloon, either tethered or free fly. We had the first airborne wedding. Um, the famous... Um, Mr. Beecher, the uh, reverend, was supposed to officiate the wedding, but he was afraid to fly. So he blessed them for the ground, and they took on the, off on the honeymoon flight. It was my very last flight in a balloon in my life. And so I moved to Northtown, Pennsylvania after the war to help recover from my, um, my malaria. I started farming in Valley Forge right near Norristown. And um, we had one of our latest inventions. Here's some of the family. Uh, Lee and Tina will tell you about one of inventions very quickly. But the... Oh, there we go. After the war, though, or during the war, remember he told you about going over the Alleghenies and he went up 17,000 feet? We knew then, because as he got up to this type of elevation before, again and again, the condensation inside a gas bag would freeze. As he would come down, he would have a mini hailstorm going around the bag, coming through the neck of the bag, onto his head. He oh knew gosh. then that fickleness was not left up. Ice. Ice was not well. Oh. <laughs> that left up to the uh, fickleness of nature. So consequently, this was one of the because uh, inventions that truly made us the richest. But um, one of the things that little people look at is that one of the first casualties of the Civil War was that because of the blockades, the South could no longer get ice, as they always had been accustomed to, to preserve their food. You know, they'd have to make and bales and whatnot, and that was the way they preserved it. They couldn't even get thread. Thread was considered a contraband. So even their card-making materials to, to make that uh, fabric, card you know, the they could, you know, the card the wool, those little metal teeth were all, everything was manufactured in, this, in the North. So this made it very obviously difficult for the South. Um, so one of the first things he did was manufacture ice, and where did he go sell it the first time? Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> and, after uh, the war? After yeah, the war. Exactly. Okay. And then shortly after that, <laughs> since there, there was difficulties with the ice production, other people took it farther than I did. But what, what was made us the, the most significant invention was this water gas shift reaction. Uh, most uh, businesses and homes used uh, coal gas to light and heat their homes and businesses. And this uh, method made it much more efficient. Usually it costs $7 for 1,000 cubic feet. Now it's 70 cents. Yeah. Everybody can now afford to, to heat and, and light their, half their homes. Which improved everybody's health. Yes. And so we had a manufacturing company that we made stoves and furnishes. We made um, gas-powered waffle irons, if you'd like one of those. Oh. Very efficient. Uh, here's myself in my later years in my office with the gas fur uh, furnace advertisement. I received uh, various awards from different um, agencies, different uh, countries for for uh, was able to do for the plight of mankind, making life easier for mankind with the, the ice and the gas processes. Um, in 1887, we moved to Pasadena, California. The, uh, the San Gabriel Mountains looked so much like the White Mountains, I fell in love with it. It was a great place to help recover from my malaria as well. And the family came out here except for a couple of the married daughters. We built, because of the money of all these uh, processes that we developed, we had a house 24,000 square feet in, in Pasadena. Largest house west of the Mississippi on Millionaire's Row. Don't ask if it's there anymore. It's not, sadly. <laughs> Condos. And uh, Leontine, um, as a Victorian woman, took a trip around the world on the ship alone. She had no chaperone. How dare you? She had a great time. She took a camera with her. Here she is on the on the ship of the desert by the Nile River. Here's a sedan chair in Canton, China. During this travel, she was a collector. She was this well-read, great education that like we talked about, and she knew mineralogy, taxonomy. Um, Indian art, all sorts of things she was expert at. Uh, here's uh, A.C. Roman from famous Roman's bookstore in Pasadena. She traveled to the southwest to observe uh, the Indians, Hopi Indians and such, and she was the first uh, white woman to see the uh, sacred Hopi Indian snake dance. She was very uh, pleased to do We've that. We've seen it, but it's in Huntington Library. It's quite, quite the, the visual. Pictures. And here's that collection. We had a 10,000-foot basement, and she stuffed it full of things. Oh, wow. <laughs> the Smithsonian said her collection was the finest private collection anywhere in the world of all these different types of items. We even had the Washington's dinner set from the White House. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I knew John Muir very well, and I became the commissioner for California for Yosemite. 
And uh, they named a mountain after me, Mount Low. We took this uh, horse trip up to the top of Oak Mountain. And in this group was Mr. Um, Andrew McNally from the famous Chicago Mc, uh, Rand McNally Map Making Company. He said, Professor Low, now that you've taken us up here, this mountain we call Mount Low now in all our maps. And you can officially now it's Mount Low. It's two peaks west of Mount Wilson. And we had the Mount Low Incline Rail. If you ever heard of the Mount Low Railway, some people may have. It was a famous tourist attraction above Pasadena. And uh, Mr. Andrew Halliday is the gentleman who designed all the gearing and stuff for the Incline Railway. He's uh, built the San Francisco rail car, uh, street, um, cable cars. And here is opening day, July 4th of 1893. The band is the first passenger plane near my God to thee as they ascend to the summit. And here's a view looking down. You know the Angels Flight in Los Angeles? This is 10 times as long and twice as steep. All electric power built in 1893. And there's the McPherson Trestle going up the incline. There's David McPherson, the engineer who designed the thing for us. It was my money, it's my dream. This is the guy that made it happen. And uh, Jason Brown, from the famous John Brown from the early uh, um, the abolitionist. This is his son, Jason Owen, both worked for the Mount Lower Railway after the war. And at the top of the Incline Railway was the Echo Mountain House, a five-star, 80-room hotel. It was the Hertz Castle of the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody from Henry Ford to Edison to John Muir, anybody famous had been there. And at the top of the Incline was what's called the Alpine Division. It went three and a half miles back into the mountains. It had 18 bridges. It's called High Bridge. And here's a circular bridge. It was a, rail, a, a rail, railroad marvel of the day. It was a 270-degree um, turn with a 5% five, a 5 incline on it. And it was an incredible a piece of, of engineering by Mr. McPherson. And there you are, early days hanging off the edge, right? Here's the hotel down the distance. At the end of the run was Ye Alpine Tavern. And uh, many of the movers and shakers, uh, Henry Huntington, Henry Ford, uh, Mr. Edison, they all traveled up there during their lives to see him. It was a very popular place to go. And we had an uh, um, observatory up there as well. We had two eminent uh, astronomers, Mr. Swift and Mr. Larkin. They discovered some comets and some nebulae from the telescope up there. The telescope is still being used at Santa Clara University. And we have the world's largest searchlight. I saw this toy at the, um, the Chicago World's Fair. Just had to have it. Bought it and brought it to, to uh, Mount Lowe. And we would uh, use it to uh, harass the neighbors. You know, it's a great advertisement. Here's Mount Lowe up here. You can hardly... Not but this it. is uh, something that we did. You just let us know it was your birthday or anniversary, and we would spotlight down on your ranch. And, but it really made the ner uh, the lovers' lane and the horses in the corral very, very nervous. So by 1930, everybody said that's enough. <laughs> but they say you could actually read a newspaper. They have a picture of Mr. Lowe and his son on Catalina Island. You could read a newspaper of the light of them. Oh wow! And here is the White City. You see the observatory here. This is the chalet, a first hotel that was up there before the uh, Echo Mountain House. And as far as the tourist attraction, over 3 million people traveled on the Mount Laurel Railway between 1893 and when it stopped in 1936. We also own the Pasadena Grand Opera House. There's uh, so much stories behind it. We're getting short on time here. We kind of transgressed a few times, too many. So if you have any questions, we're going to kind of give you some sense of so at least you get some visuals. Uh, the Mount Low uh, was represented in the Rose Parade in 1894 as a working model the Mount Low Railway. In 1895, our carriage won the grand award for the best decorated carriage in the Rose Parade. Like, That's how they were bringing people out to California. It was called the Valley Hunt Club originally. And they wanted to advertise that in California, all their houses were covered with flowers, not snow. So let's bring everybody out here. Let's build in California, but we're going to give you better weather. Aren't that what they're still doing today? <laughs> And other business ventures, uh, Professor Lowe, as um, Lindsay said earlier, had 200 patents, and he had more than 30 businesses here in Southern California, yeah. and also some in San Francisco, and says she was a very, very uh, busy gentleman. And the panic of 1893, uh, basically the biggest uh, crash they had before the, the, um, the Depression, um, 1893, it wasn't a, a dot-com bubble or a real estate bubble like we had, it was a railroad, bu the railroad bubble. The railroad so overextended too many, and the stock market crashed. And this was the eventual downfall of Professor Lowe and the Mellow Railway and such. And uh, he put every, all the money he had into it and uh, slowly, slowly dwindled away. Here are some events that led to the downfall, uh, the burning down of the Echo Mountain House. Windstorms blew the observatory dome Nature down. Nature won. Yep. Floods, fires, you name it. And if they didn't disappear, the last fire we had up there a few years ago, it'd be gone now. <laughs> and here's uh, my brothers, Percival and Pembroke. They have a history behind them, too. The daughters. 
My Three Sons. Uh, the fifth anniversary, 1905. Uh, she, uh, Lintine mentioned Poncho Barnes or Florence Lintine. That's her as a little girl. First air show in America was in uh, up the road in Rancho Dominguez in 1910. I took Lintine and uh, little Florence Lintine with us and um, said, "Baby, one day you'll be up the up the flying." And she became a famous aviatrix after that. One fifth of California's population was here for those ten days of the air show. Wow. Huge event. And um, my last invention was a low pilot airship. I saw these rickety little airplanes flying, these little stick and fabric airplanes that carry, carry two people at a time. They'll never amount to anything. So we figure, you know, we can make a cruise ship of the air. This is my concept here. It's an artist concept flying over the San Gabriel Mountains and our observatory here. But unfortunately, in uh, 1913, it never happened because we passed away. Lee and Teen first, <laughs> and myself shortly thereafter. Couldn't live without her. Just months apart. Oh. And there we are. Wow. There they are. Our heroes of the day. Thank you so much for your attention and for your interest. Oh. Appreciate it very much.